I wish to express sincere gratitude to the founder, His Excellency J.J. Rawlings, the Council of Elders, members of the National Executive Committee, the Functional Executive Committee, the entire rank and file of the NDC, and general public for their incredible support and for their many, many words of encouragement, those pronounced publicly and those spoken in private. I'm grateful to all of you. We are all aware that much as many have come before me, you've heard a lot of their names, many have come before me, this is the first time in our history that a major political party has nominated a woman on his ticket to become vice president. I wish to assure the leadership and rank and file of the party that I come to this position with the mindset of a team player. I belong to all of you and will always count on your support and guidance. This is a journey we will take together. Your Excellency John Ramani Mahama, your singular decision to select me as your running mate has generated a whole web of responsibilities, a whole web of responses rather, and debates in this country. And I keep saying that I didn't know that my name will create such an atmosphere. But importantly, out of all the debates, the major po point for me is the new focal point for girls and women. You have respected women. The women of Ghana will not forget. The youth will remember. Generations to come will commit your decision to memory and make it a reference point. We will partner with our men and youth, as we always have done, and work hard to achieve peace in our land, because that is the best way to respond to this high recognition. Thank you very much. Making history is gratifying, but, but what really matters is not to be the first through the door. What matters is to hold that door open for those behind us. What matters is to create other avenues for self-actualization for many more. That is the work of the next four years. Many are those who are now more energized to vote, thanks to the momentous decision, JM, that you have made. I urge them all to do just that. We plan not to disappoint you. By your advice and your choice, you have turned the struggles of many women who have come before this moment into a probability. We, and I refer to the men, the women, our youth, our children, we all have a chance to finally make real our dreams of serving this country at any level, of removing doubts and proving once again that collectively we are all capable. This is the time we have been waiting for. Alo nyemi mi male. Ensa yebo tumi ya ye. Nyami nye hembo afo. After serious reflection, consultations, prayers, and encouragement of colleagues, of family, of my, my children, I am very happy to have accepted the nomination to be the running mate of the presidential candidate of the great National Democratic Congress.
Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this is an act of faith which I do not take lightly at all. I do not underrate the huge responsibilities and expectations that come with the call. I heard some of the women. But I call all, on all of us to translate our excitement and approval into action for the benefit of the good people of our beloved country. I accepted the nomination fundamentally because it is an opportunity to serve my country once again, albeit at a higher level. In God do I continue to trust that I may never be confounded. And I know the Methodists among us know where that line is coming from. I am deeply humbled by the trust of our party and nation and I'm excited to make a good case to the good people of Ghana as to why the J&J &J ticket is best poised to confront the daunting challenges of our time and usher Ghana into peace, into recovery, into prosperity. It will be my mission to ensure that the voices and concerns of our children, our youth, our aged, and our persons with disabilities are reflected in critical decisions. Together, all of us, we can strategize to solve long-standing problems of needless and unproductive discrimination and thrive as valued citizens. I want you all, all of us, in whatever demographic category to know that I will carry your voices forward. Together, we can make this happen. This I pledge to you. I wish that going forward, I could meet you again in the same fashion we did when we started the process of framing our manifesto and listen to your concerns, challenges, and hopes for the future. It would have been my job and my joy, as I've done in the past, to sit with you in the market, in your shop, on the farms, at the beaches, by the roadside, and in the institutions, to think and plan together, argue and even laugh at each other. But these are not normal times. COVID-19 is real, no doubt. There is no doubt about it that it is real. However, we will together find safer ways to meet and talk and plan and strategize for the good of our country. We will collectively work out the way forward so that we own our agenda. We must own our agenda in this country. Men and women together have accomplished fantastic things in our history. But I'm also acknowledged that today I stand on the shoulders of many giants who came before me. Throughout our history, women have always played pivotal roles in the advancement of what today has become our country. When duty called, our women too responded. We all have in mind great heroines who by their actions shattered the concept that women alone must be restricted by ceilings and limitations. I salute those many women who have made such great contributions to the advancement of our country. And just as importantly, I pay homage to those many, many unknown women, the silent and invisible and unacknowledged women and men who also played and continue to play critical roles in building what we now call Ghana. Now do allow me to tell you a little bit about myself, very briefly. I'm Nana Jane. I think that's news. <laughs> I was born in Cape Coast, a town with rich and intriguing connections to the Ghanaian story. My parents come from the holy city of Komenda. Remember the Komenda Sugar Factory? 
They are called Kofinyame in Abata. I won't tell you their Christian names. And these two people are, have blessed the earth and are blessed of God and man forever. I wish them peaceful rest. One of my beloved mothers, biological mother of my oldest sibling, who became a great friend, comes from Alabanyo, but she spent a great deal of her life in Pando. Mama Ruth, heading here. Growing up as a little girl, I didn't dream of standing in this position, not that I knew that it even existed. However, what I knew and what I believed, along with my siblings, was that if I studied and focused enough, and especially if my actions benefited others before they benefited me, there was nothing impossible to achieve in our beloved country. I still believe these values that other people matter too. My parents believed and they demonstrated in our lives that good quality education and hard work would open for me a world of possibilities. My parents' conviction made us all believe in our own ability to pursue any goal and also believe in the rewards of grit and determination. Becoming the first female vice chancellor in Ghana was for me the most tangible testament to this fact. And here, let me once again congratulate Professor Rita Dixon, recently appointed vice chancellor of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. And as well, to extend congratulations to Dr. Koyo Enim Wright, who becomes the first female registrar of UPSA where this event is taking place. This country called Ghana has given me the opportunity to live out that promise and to aspire to the limits of my own potential. It has continuously rewarded a life of hard work and offered me the privilege to give back through service. It is precisely because of where my story began that I know what is possible in this country and what the individual can achieve. These are the same lessons I passed on to my students and of course to my children and nephews and so on. And especially I hope to pass on to my two adorable grandsons the joys of my life. But it is also because of where my story began that I know it takes more than just great and good work ethic. I had good opportunities also. That made a difference in my life because my origins and upbringing are not unique. Villages and towns across our country are full of stories like mine. They are full of parents making untold sacrifices for the sake of their children and to ensure their futures. They are full of market women, fishermen, and farmers toiling in the sun to feed their children on their backs and those they have left behind at home. The stories are full of young mothers and fathers who are balancing family life work obligations and entrepreneurial ambitions. The young mother and yes, the young father who often has to manage family life, employment and other commitments seamlessly. We are a people who jump over many hurdles. This too shall pass. Walking that road is an act of courage. That experience is a forge of character. Villages and towns in our country are full of brilliant young people 
with great ambitions and boundless energy. They are full of young people who rightly aspire to bring their own children into a better Ghana than their parents did. We must facilitate that. Throughout the years, I have been blessed to meet and interact with numerous Ghanaians in every region of our country whose experiences echo mine. I have taught and mentored thousands of youth from all walks of life over the course of my career. And I have always been inspired by their passion, by their determination, by their posi positivity, and by their desire to succeed. But without good, meaningful opportunities, all of that toil and resilience and determination sum up to nothing but frustration and all that youthful energy amounts to yet more wasted potential. We must harvest that. Far too often in this country, this is how the story ends. And so, clearing the hurdles in their path, giving them a hand up and not just a hand out, offering them plans and not just promises, these must be the immediate priorities of our national agenda. In today's turbulent political economic climate, I propose that there are four crucial factors to consider in tackling issues relating to youth and gender. First, we must be mindful of the fact that 60% of our population will be under the age 30 in a few years ahead of us. This is why it is so important and critical that we systematically reform all our institutions and all our systems to effectively address the aspirations of our youth in this country. Second, second, we need meaningful quality and comprehensive education that goes beyond access and numbers and responds to the future we can actualize. Third, we must leverage on vocational and technical training to equip many into fulfilling and creative and meaningful work. Such will advance our development. Fourth, fourth we must provide opportunities that transcend political patronage, connection, the practice of whom you know. We need equal opportunity and fair opportunities based on merit. And these are imperative for sustainable economic growth. The time for that shift is now. <laughs> Truth be told, despite all our challenges, Ghana remains a special place where any dream should be possible where every aspiration matters, where everyone, be it a little boy from Boli or a little girl from Komenda, can and should aspire to be anything they want to be, even president, even vice president. And this is why we love our country so much. We must continue to make this country a place we cherish and are proud to belong to, a place of opportunities. In the past and more so recently, I have had extensive discussions with His Excellency John Mahama about issues confronting our country and his vision for the coming years. These have been broad, passionate, and engaging. In John Mahama, and you have to work closely to get to know other aspects of him. You'll find a person who is thoughtful, visionary, makes no claim to perfection, and admits his mistakes and missteps, and valuable lessons learned from them. 
Surely, our society is better served with such down-to-earth, considerate, and reflective leadership. We have chosen the path of peace, inclusiveness, self-reliance, leading to belief in ourselves to solve our problems. It is an important avenue through which to turn our current circumstances into opportunities that yield great dividends for us all. And us in this context should and must include generations unborn. It is our business to think about them also. Their lives also matter. It is clear that with the right direction and resolve, with all of us being part of the forward march, our country is destined for greatness. We can and must right the course of our country. We all admit that we can put our country on a firmer, more sustainable path, a path of peace, in order to move forth in ways that are meaningful and clear. At this time, I say to the SHS students who are writing the exams, let me assure you that I have children your age in the same situation too, if not biological. Therefore, I understand the difficult situation you are going through, and especially the anxiety that you have as some of your colleagues and staff got infected by the COVID-19. There are also, sadly, reports of deaths of students and other staff. The partisan nature of our politics today makes it difficult for even to ask a simple question about the handling of the COVID-19 pandemic without triggering a whole political brawl. This is not helpful. All the same, my condolences to the family. Believe us, many of us share in your loss. I ask us all to be very disciplined about following the WHO guidelines and government directives by taking good care of ourselves. And some of us may understand these protocols a little better. Let us share that knowledge. Let us save lives, no matter whose life is saved. Countrymen and women, all we are doing right now is what has been and has always been a very simple exercise of registration. What is not so simple this time is that the exercise is taking place in a time of a dreadful pandemic that is still evolving and in our case still rising. As if all of this is not bad enough, the level of violence, brute force, bloodletting, and sheer breakdown of law and order in an otherwise straightforward act of registering to vote is unbecoming of our country, especially of a country, especially of a country that until recently was hailed as the fulcrum of democracy in our region. How did we descend into this situation? The answer is simple. When there appears to be selective justice, when some offenders are not even placed on the hook, but are hailed and promoted and excused for being nasty and violent, the logical outcome is what we see. This situation of people dying, being harassed because they have decided to register to vote, it's not a story you can tell any child in the future. How will you begin that story? And when that child asks you their favorite question, why? What will we say? And if they add a few questions and they ask, so what did you do? Or what did you say? What will be our response? We need to show up and vote come December 7th. Each one of us must jealously guard our sacred right to vote and reject the attempts by some to disenfranchise some. We are all Ghanaians and we love this country deeply 
and we make contributions to the running of our country. Do not let anyone make you feel otherwise. The choice we have in this election is very clear. We can either build a Ghana where every citizen, regardless of background, is afforded equal opportunity to become their best selves, or we can continue on a path where a few people attempt to control and dictate the destiny of the people who have given them the privilege to govern in the first place. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let our policies deviate from this unproductive path of injustice and non-peace. We, the people of Ghana, all of us, are the protectors and owners of this country for our collective good and for that of generations unborn. You know, what makes Ghana so special is that despite our various ethnic groups, religions, diverse backgrounds, we all come together as one people under one flag, inspired by the sacrifices of our ancestors to create a great country. And everyone's ancestor has been a worthy contributor to the space we now call Ghana. This country now called Ghana, whose artificial borders sadly we seek to make even more artificial, as if our continent has not suffered enough from the initial assault. Everyone matters. We have come too far as a nation to still cling to our primordial tribal bigotries. This must stop. Diversity is a source of great strength. Whether you are Ga, Infante, Sisali, Ewe, whether you are Gonja, Asante, Zima, or whatever, or Mampusi, or any other ethnic group, you are valued as a Ghanaian. You have every right to walk with confidence, with a high resolve to make huge contributions to this country. Let nobody, let no one question your identity or your patriotism. It is time to put all these needless, unproductive, and downright backward distractions behind us and get on with the serious business of nation building. The time is now. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the 21st century is nearly 20% over. We shouldn't be here as a country living with inexcusable insanitary conditions, with our babies still dying of malaria, our women delivering on the bare floor, our youth bewildered and unable to see their way ahead. Parents confused about the future of their children and the quality of education they are getting. If we choose to be anywhere as a country, the destination should not include a place where a 90-year-old woman is stoned to death because somebody has decided that she's a witch. What is that? I call on our security agencies to convince us that she has not died in vain. As indicated, the 21st century is nearly 20% of the time gone, and we shouldn't be here. The very foundations of our democracy, so threatened by unimaginable levels of arrogance, of intolerance, of violence, of human beings playing God, our economy struggling, our tongues tied to the roof of our mouths, our citizens feeling unsafe, our farmers unsure of when to plant crops due to climate change. We shouldn't be here in the 21st century, our youth perishing on their way to find better lives away from home, our institutions to which we should run for succor rapidly losing credibility. We shouldn't be here when children who should be in school are becoming unwitting brides. When we all know that marriage is not a child's business. At a time of a growing number of cases and deaths arising from the pandemic, 
with their attendant fears and uncertainties, uncertainties. At a time when some of our children are leaving school not any more literate than when they entered, others graduating into unemployment, the vulnerable and cared for, none of us should be here behaving as if the best response or the best antidote to all of the above is to flex muscles, to turn aspects of our protective institutions into agents of intimidation and arrogate to ourselves the right to alienate people who have always lived on this part of the world long before some did and who have served our country with distinction. Other things should be occupying our time in the 21st century. We can spend all those resources and energies on ways to confront our artificial borders and work towards the inclusion that solidifies our continent. Let me assure our youth that we have not always been like this. I have had endless conversations with many of you, and I can understand your frustrations and sense of despair. But as I keep assuring you, we have not always been like this. No, as you also know, we have not always been like this. Giving up is never an option. Stay the course. As a people, we have survived many unspeakable atrocities. Read and know your history. We just celebrated the year of return. And I'm addressing the youth now. We've, we've just celebrated that. Read that history very, very carefully. And you'll notice that our history has not been a very nice cup of chilled sobolo. Yes, we are in a difficult phase. And this phase will only pass with our collective determination, plain, honest, hard work, and willingness to put in practice those values of integrity, of meritocracy, and of inclusiveness. Let's reignite the Ghanaian spirit of caring, of sharing, of kind hospitality, and sincerity. We know we can. All minds linked, God our helper. I wish to assure our Muslim brothers and sisters that as our leader John Dramani Mahama has consistently done in the past, going forward, there will be none of the unwarranted discrimination directed at you, and indeed, no Ghanaian should feel alienated due to religion or ethnicity. This coming Thursday is a great day of Arafah, and the Prophet Muhammad, may he rest in peace, admonished you to fast. In this moment, please pray for us. Especially pray for the peace of this country and pray for Allah's bountiful blessings. I wish you all Eid Mubarak in advance. <laughs> to all the little girls and boys across our country, always dream big. Remain focused. You can grow to become anything you want to be. Believe that only you can stop yourselves. Going forward, it is not going to be about your parents, rich or poor, not the region you come from, whether it is endowed with resources or not. It is going to be about a system that works, a functioning country that respects all its citizens and provides opportunity to everybody, no matter what. The time is ripe for change. That time is now. <laughs> to my sisters and daughters, we are in this together. You know, as I do, that it has not been and it will not be an easy walk. But as we all know, it's a possible walk. We will walk it and we will get there. I know too well the unspoken and unspeakable weight of responsibilities and concerns that we bear as women, much more so at these difficult times. What we have always shown, however, 
is that when we have the opportunity, many of us choose to bring on our best game. We earn our seats at the table and we excel. Our results, our benefits transform our families, communities and country. And sometimes our benefits go beyond our borders, porous, artificial or otherwise. Our democracy has come a long way, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Yet it remains fragile. It calls on all of us to exercise our civic duty against any obstacles and machinations. I urge us all to show up and participate in the last phases of the registration exercise, even whilst you observe all the health protocols. Please look out for each other. Politely remind people to wear their face masks correctly. Offer your hand sanitizer to somebody in need. If you see a disabled person or an elderly person or a pregnant woman, offer help, for that is the Ghanaian spirit. I extend a hand to everybody, no matter how disappointed you have become, no matter the depth of your frustration, your anger, no matter the depth of your despair. Come, let us chart a path for our country built on the values of trust, of responsible citizenship, of putting others first, and of speaking polite language. Come, let us link our efforts and thoughts to rebuild our institutions. Let's build a truly independent, inclusive nation that is not afraid to respect the views of others. A country confident enough to accept other ways of seeing, of respecting everyone, no matter the person. I'm calling on our men, women, our youth, our children, that we should team up and build the Ghana we can have, which must belong to all of us, and which must pay special working and workable attention to the vulnerable. We must bring back the proverbial Ghanaian hospitality. That seems locked down, if not quarantined. <laughs> we must ease restrictions on the Ghana we know that respects that tolerates, that liberates. The time is now. As a country, Ghana has been poised for flight for too long. Ghana must be in full flight. We should be in full flight towards a sustainable, towards sustainable development to a destination of peace, inclusion, self-confidence, plain honesty, where good old hard work matters. I call on all our countrymen and women who believe that our country can once again travel the path of hope to come join us. The time to do that is now. Forth in the name of our country we go. We will not be intimidated. Our resolve to serve this country remains strong. And as my nephew says, no shaking. And sometimes he adds, no bagawaya. Yeah. We will stay the course. Sorry. We will not be distracted. We shall remain focused. We will raise high the flag of Ghana. The time to do so is now. And inshallah, we will succeed. May God bless you all. May God bless you, JM, for this decision that has generated so much. May God bless our determination to serve our country. May God bless the NDC. May God bless our homeland, Ghana.